Welcome back everybody. In today's video, I want to talk about leveling up your mastery of artificial intelligence by asking better questions. Let's get started. So in a previous video, I talked about there being multiple levels of expertise in artificial intelligence. And in particular, you have beginners that don't know what they don't know. They're just kind of fumbling around trying to learn the fundamentals. You have intermediate students that are able to use their mastery of the fundamentals to implement the research conducted by other people and they get consistent results with respect to what the authors outline in the paper. And then of course you have the experts themselves that are generating the new ideas and writing the research papers that the rest of us are trying to implement. So I think that in addition to your mastery of fundamentals, one thing that distinguishes the different tiers of experts is the types of questions that they ask. Now, in my framework for thinking about thinking, I understand that there are three types of questions. This is just broad, broadly speaking, you know, there are, of course, exceptions to this, uh, note some notable ones at that. So don't take this, you know, as gospel or anything. This is just kind of a framework for thinking about the topic at hand. So there are what, how, and why questions. I noticed from my work as a Udemy instructor, which, shameless plug, my two courses on turning deep reinforcement learning papers into code are on sale right now. Check the link in the description. I noticed from these courses that students' questions tend to fall into the first two camps, the what and the how. So let's go over these briefly. So the what types of questions generally center around what do I do? So a student will uh, be able to work up to a certain point and they get kind of lost. They don't see the next step in the solution. So their question is, you know, what do I do? Either they've encountered some type of bug or they have uh, uh, simply run into the limit of their understanding of the material and they don't know how to progress. The next type of question is the how. So the, in this case, a student has an idea of how to proceed, uh, but they don't necessarily have a full grasp of the mechanics of doing so. They understand the concepts, but not necessarily the execution. So with the what questions, you don't understand the the concepts you need to implement uh, with the how questions you don't understand the how to implement those particular concepts even though you may understand them and then finally if you can unlock the next level of expertise the final tier of questions is the why question uh, these are the most profound and these are what lead to actual discoveries uh, and they these questions center around why is something a certain way you know what you could even say what what are the assumptions behind how something works as i said this is kind of a loose framework uh, but the basic idea is that at the top tiers of research, they are cons the researchers are more uh, preoccupied with the why behind the things that they are doing. What are the fundamental principles at work? You know, they are ca fully capable of implementing the solution once they have the solution in mind, uh, but they are most fundamentally concerned with why things work the way they do. So how is it that you go from asking the what type questions to asking the how type questions? Well, I would love to tell you that the answer is found in a book or the answer is found in taking my course, but that's not the reality. The reality is that the answer is found in solving problems. You must achieve a basic level of competency in solving all level of problems from very simple to intermediate to even more advanced problems on your own without the help of others. Now, how do you do this? Now, the basic idea is you have to start very, very simple. Uh, if you're watching this video, you're obviously a smart, very, very smart person in the upper tier of IQ of society because otherwise you wouldn't have even found me, right? So you're obviously a very smart person and so you're probably mathematically inclined, especially if you're interested in artificial intelligence. As it turns out, mathematics and physics, chemistry are phenomenal ways to learn how to solve problems. And that's because, and I'm not much of a chemist, but I do have a PhD in physics. At least in physics, when you're talking about textbook problems, there's a set sequence of steps with a little bit of wiggle room and maybe the order in which you do things, uh, but there is a set sequence of steps you have to follow to arrive at a solution. And so you learn to see the relationships between uh, cause and effect within a problem and how to map out the path from the very beginning, operating from first principles, to getting the end result, which is an answer to the question. Now, I don't recommend you go get a PhD in physics just to learn how to solve problems. That's a very circuitous route to learning how to do it. Uh, but there are a number of things you can do, no matter where you are, what level you're at. Uh, the first of which is to achieve a basic level of competency with mathematics. And that's because computer science is 
fundamentally built upon mathematics as well as, and in particular, artificial intelligence. So you don't have to be, again, a math PhD, a math major, anything like that, but you do have to be able to implement solutions to mathematical problems in code. And that is fundamentally important and and in fact, it is the easiest way to gain competency in solving problems is through solving basic mathematical problems using a computer. Now, there are a number of resources available online for this, and one in particular is something called Project Euler. Uh, it's where you have to implement solutions to a bunch of math problems using whatever coding language of your choice. Uh, and this is, again, for the bottom tier of competency. And you may think, you know, Phil, what does this have to do with solving artificial intelligence problems? How is this going to get me from being, you know, a beginner all the way up to an expert? Well, certainly the experts in the field started out by solving mathematical problems, right? They went to undergraduate in almost, you know, all cases. They have university educations and probably all the way up through a Ph.D., so they had to study mathematics at some point in their career. So they built a basic competency in solving mathematical problems. And in many cases, I know for myself and my physics PhD and uh, studying nonlinear dynamics, we had to use stuff like Mathematica to solve those mathematical problems. So as I said, you don't have to go get a degree to do this. You can just go ahead and do it and learn how to solve basic problems using mathematics and a computer. That will give you, A, the ability to solve problems from start to finish because you know they have a definite uh, endpoint a definite answer and in general only a few steps in between and B it will give you the confidence you need to solve harder and harder problems and so once you have the capability to map out problems from start to finish you arrive at the field of how is it that I go through with implementing this and again the only way forward is through the fire as it were you have to actually solve problems and at this stage I would recommend uh, solving papers I would recommend solving the more fundamental type papers so for instance I'm working on a natural language processing course so I'm going to go through the original papers on say the word Vec algorithm uh, and implement it myself and then have the students implement it in code uh, so that you get this uh, sense of understanding of where the fundamentals of the field come from as well as um, how to build the toolkit that you're going to be using later on because if you understand the toolkit you're building it becomes more obvious to you how those tools fit into solving the problems that you kind of know how to solve you just don't know what tools to use now at this point some people may point out that they believe you should become an expert in a particular framework this is not something I could fundamentally disagree with more. You should not be an expert in PyTorch. You should not be an expert in TensorFlow. Unless, of course, you're you know one of the core developers, and you should probably be an expert in it. But if you're just someone who uses it, being an expert in a framework doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Now, let's take a more obvious example. If you were hiring someone to be a contractor on your home, and they told you they were an expert with a hammer, would you have very much confidence in their capabilities? No, of course not. You want them to be an expert in going from, hey, I want to you know, knock out this wall and replace it with whatever, to actually implementing that in a safe and code compliant way, right? In other words, you want someone with a fundamental understanding of how to build stuff, how to destroy stuff, how to you know, actually transform a space from one thing into another. And so I wouldn't recommend mastering a particular framework, also because these frameworks change. You know, I know from my course, uh, I specify in DeepQ Learning, the DeepQ Learning course to use uh, PyTorch 1, which of course nobody does because, well, at this point it's an older version, right? It's six months old, so everybody's going to be using the latest version, like 1.4 or 1.5 or whatever. And so this is a perfectly logical and rational thing to do on their part, but unfortunately it causes the code to break. Stuff that worked in PyTorch 1 no longer works in PyTorch 1.5. So uh, becoming an expert in a framework means that you have to stay up to date on a framework, and that's really a waste of your time. What you should be an expert in is reading documents, knowing how to look up the specific things you need to use within the documentation to leverage it for whatever project you're working on. Okay, so you've mastered the ability to solve basic problems. You're confident in your ability to solve problems. You can look at a particular problem and see the steps in the solution, and you have worked through enough material that you can see the steps to that solution and actually implement them on your own. How do you go to asking the more fundamental questions? And this is where the fun really begins. So to ask the fundamental questions, you have to... Uh, this is something you should do really in parallel with the second step is you need to be asking the why behind certain things. You know, why is it that we do things a certain way? So, for instance, why do we use uh, many batches in, say, stochastic gradient descent? Why is it a batch process instead of using the entire data set? Wouldn't that be better to use the whole data set? Why use a batch at all? Hey, while you're at it, 
Why do we use deep neural networks? You know, what is the point of a deep neural network? What is it good for? When would you not want to use it? What are the fundamental assumptions around how a deep neural network is used? And uh, what are its limitations? When would we not want to use it, et cetera, et cetera. You need to be focused on the why behind everything it is that you're learning. And a big thing to do to understand that is to ask what are the assumptions behind a certain thing and identifying assumptions is something you can do with pretty much anything it's not just confined to uh, programming software that kind of stuff it is a universal principle what are the assumptions underlying an argument really it has to do with philosophy uh, which is of course the first natural science uh, that underpins everything else we do what is the what are the assumptions and the logical steps of an argument you can do this and in particular it's best to do this with news uh, because let's face it there is no news anymore it's virtually all propaganda from one side or another meant to convince you of something and underlying those arguments are certain assumptions what the news article is telling you uh, is true is only true under a certain set of conditions you know some things are only good if you assume other things to be true right so you need to be able to identify key assumptions underlying arguments once you understand underlying assumptions you get a deeper understanding of the why behind things work uh, as well as uh, the things you should be looking for in different sets of circumstances so what happens if you tweak an assumption, if you add an additional assumption, if you subtract an assumption, how does that change the problem at hand? You know, what are the fundamental principles at play? So this is very abstract, and that's because the thinking at the highest levels is, of course, very abstract. Uh, for instance, you know, there is, uh, let's talk about the Singularity Institute, or, you know, just the whole concept of a, a singularity. So the basic idea is that, uh, as Ray Kurzweil posited, uh, due to Moore's Law, you know, technology, the computational power doubles every 18 months. It's kind of slowed down, but whatever it doesn't change the argument, it just changes the time scale. Uh, so computational power doubles over some short time period, short time period. And so after some number of period of doublings, you will achieve a computational power that is equivalent to that of a human brain, therefore artificial general intelligence, and therefore eventually artificial super intelligence because it's just going to keep on going, right? Well, what are the fundamental assumptions underlying that argument? I'll, I'll invite you to pause the video here and to identify those assumptions and then hear my analysis. I'll wait, don't worry. Did you pause? I hope so, because there's one huge, huge assumption underlying this argument, and that argument is that intelligence is computational power, right? They're, they're equivocating computational power with intelligence. Now, that may be the case. I don't know. I honestly don't think it is, but it could be the case, in which case the argument is sound, but it could also not be the case, right? Um, and the reason I don't think it's the case, if you're at all curious, is because I think consciousness and intelligence are inherently linked. Have you ever tried to solve a problem when you're asleep? It doesn't work so well. You can do it in your, actually, you can do it kind of, sort of, subconsciously while you're dreaming. You can get flashes of inspiration that you remember when you wake up. But again, that's some level of consciousness, even if it isn't direct waking consciousness. You know, if you put someone under anesthesia and say, hey, when you wake up, I want you to have the answer to this math question, it's going to be a no-go, right? They can't solve a question if they're not conscious. And so obviously computers aren't conscious, or so we think. And so I don't necessarily think a computer can achieve any real level of intelligence beyond narrow sets of pattern right between the, uh, beyond the narrow case of pattern recognition, statistics, and mathematics and stuff like that. But anyway, enough of my thoughts on that aside. The point is that um, the fundamental assumption of the singularity argument is that computational power is intelligence, and that is a very questionable assumption, right? Uh, that's not been proven. Nobody's proven that. It's just taken for granted. Same thing with the, you know, uh, mind uploading or the simulation argument. You assume you can even simulate a mind. Who says you can do that? Nobody said you can. You assume you can, but, you know, hey, you don't know that for a fact. And so that is how you go from the how, understanding the steps, uh, outlining a problem, but not necessarily having total mastery of everything in between, to asking the more fundamental questions in a field, identifying assumptions, identifying fundamental principles at play. And as another aside, while I'm ranting, that is what makes Elon Musk so great, is that he operates on the conception of first principles. He says, forget what everybody else thinks to be true. What is it that we know to be true? Just basic physics. Uh, what are the basic physics of building a rocket, of building an electric car? You know, what are the basics of that? And what follows from those basics? And so if you focus on fundamental principles, 
you may not be Elon Musk, but you can at least start to ask better, higher quality questions that will help set you apart as a thought leader in the field of artificial intelligence. If you have liked today's video, I know it was a bit rambly, but if you've liked it, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you've seen my work before and you want to support me, hit the link in the description to find my two courses on sale right now. Uh, either way, I hope to see you all in the next video.